Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie Arisate, and I am the coordinator for this year's International Development Roundtable Series. The International Development Roundtable Series is a high-profile seeker series where leaders and practitioners within the international development sphere address our students, faculty, and broader communication on trends that are shaping the field. On behalf of the international development community, I would like to welcome you to today's event featuring Dr. Daniel Twinning, President of the International Republican Institute, and Derek Mitchell, President, Ambassador Derek Mitchell, President of the National Democratic Institute. Our conversation will also be moderated by Professor Sands, Director of the Center for Canadian Studies at SAIS. Um, with the rise of populism around the world and democratic backsliding in recent years, what is the future of democratic existence and the role of the United States moving forward? We'll be exploring this topic and more during today's event. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Professor Sands. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, it's great to be here. I love collaborating across the silos of science and talking to international development. I uh, run the Center for Canadian Studies, but I'm not Canadian. Uh, <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Detroit, and uh, of all things, great it's place. Close. It has development challenges of its own. It's close to no, it's close. <clears throat> But the, the thing that Stephanie did not mention in her introduction is that she and I both had a real interest in pulling this program together. Stephanie worked for NDI um, before coming to SICE, and I worked for the International Republican Institute uh, before, well, while I was working on my PhD, which did not make my advisor very happy. Uh -huh. But uh, nonetheless, I worked there before I became a regular professor here. So I've known... Uh, Derek Mitchell, who worked at CSIS with me when I was at Think Tank, and I've known Dan Twining, who worked at IRI with me, was actually working with Senator McCain and keeping an eye on, on us rascals. Um, but I've known them for a number of years, and they're terrific guys, and I really, I think Stephanie and I both wanted to bring them here to talk about democracy assistance and the way in which this particular area of development assistance is going and, and what it accomplishes. So let me start um, with just the most basic question of all. What is democracy assistance? What, what is it we're trying to do uh, when we provide assistance of this sort with USAID money and NED money and so forth? I guess in order here, I'll go first. And let me just say, <laughs> first of all, um, they gave us a list of questions that I think we'll go back and do an essay on, on all the questions they've given us just so we're in keeping with the academic atmosphere. The other thing I should say is this is a, an ironic moment for me and a little out-of-body experience. I worked at NDI. I'm president of NDI now. I worked at NDI 20 years ago. NDI's offices were here, literally here. My office was right outside in the hallway across the way. This was our conference room. I'm sitting. I haven't been back here since 1997. <laughs> so, and I, yeah. so thank you. Uh, literally in this space. So coming back, talking about NDI as president in the exact spot where I used to work is a little bit surreal. Um, democracy assistance is, it's a, um, it's, a, it's a genre that was developed uh, in practice, really, 35 years ago. Uh, and I think Dan can talk a bit about the genesis of Ronald Reagan giving a speech at Westminster during the Cold War saying we need to be competing with um, the Soviets. They have their own, um, own way of promoting their values. And he thought, well, we have our values, we should be proud of our values, and we should be out there providing you know, explicit assistance. Uh, according to those, and particularly on democracy. So NDI and IRI were formed, and National Endowment for Democracy was formed. And no one knew then what that meant. What does it mean to support, to do programs that underwrite democracy assistance, underwrite democracy around the world development? So it was basically developed from scratch of people figuring out, and I think IRI had a slightly different way of thinking about it than we did, but we've come, I think there's been convergence over the years, where it's really trying to develop the nuts and bolts of a democratic system, democratic society. And traditionally, the way we've done it is focusing on democratic institutions, uh, things like parliaments, having effective parliaments, having uh, strong political parties, having uh, civil society organizations that are strong and understand their role, um, elections, election integrity. So we became known as the ones in the 80s you'd hear about who monitor elections and if you, or observe elections, uh, or work with civil, civic groups on the ground to monitor their own elections. So these are the nuts and bolts of democracy, of, of institution building of democracy. And then also democratic processes, that how do you interact? How do elections go? Civil society and parliaments, how do they interact? All these different components of what goes into a democratic system. Uh, and then the final component, which was, I don't think probably 
asserted enough. We need to do more of this, and we need it more in America, to be honest, which is civics and democratic culture, democratic mindsets. In fact, in America, I think we have instinctively, because we've grown up with it, a kind of democratic instinct, a participation of assertion of rights and such. But many countries overseas in who underwent transitions, um, they will have old mindsets. They'll have mindsets of looking to leadership, looking to authorities, not having real sense that they should be organizing themselves. They have a right to organize, and that they should expect things from their government, that their government should be responsive to them. So those mindsets of democracy are also important. I think that's also what we try to do through our efforts, and we can talk about how we do that, I think, in this, in this conversation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So I won't uh, retread uh, the ground Derek has covered. Um, could I just say I didn't have an office in this building, but my dad went here. He was the first class. Sice created uh, a master's degree in African studies in the very early 60s, just as Africa was decolonizing. I mean, there hadn't been a previously a field of African studies because Africa was run by Europeans. Um, and this had a really profound impact, not just on his life, but on my life, because that meant I grew up in Africa. And growing up in Africa in the 80s was, of course, very interesting because there were basically no democracies in Africa. I mean, even South Africa was an apartheid state, right, in which most of the population could not properly participate. Uh, I looked at a map in the Freedom House, uh, Freedom in the World survey in 1982, and they had two countries in Africa. So there are 54 countries in Africa. They had two of them as being free. And I think it was Botswana and Nigeria. Uh, and Nigeria, of course, had been through a cycle of coups and democratic openings followed by coups. So even Nigeria, I would say, was iffy back then. Uh, fast forward to today, and Africa is full of democracies. Uh, think about the world of 1982 when Ronald Reagan gave his speech at Westminster in the United Kingdom, where he called for a global campaign to support and build the infrastructure of democracy. In 1982, uh, the Soviet Union uh, dominated the entire area from East Berlin to Vladivostok. Uh, there were essentially no free countries in Asia other than India and Japan. Uh, that map of Africa and the Freedom House Report in 82 was all black. Uh, the map of the Middle East, except for Israel, uh, was all black. Uh, most of Europe uh, was unfree. Uh, big chunks of Latin America, I mean, important countries, uh, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico were run by one-party system. So a lot has changed, actually, since our institutions were established as part of this national endowment for democracy. And of course, it's quite interesting, because I think during the Cold War, we all understood in the West that there was a real ideological challenge, and that the Soviets did have an alternative model. When the wall came down in 1989, I think many people learned a truth that perhaps they had not realized before, which is that all people actually aspire to the same things, which are the freedom to choose, the freedom to speak, uh, the freedom to organize, the freedom to choose their leaders, the freedom to peacefully depose their leaders, holding them accountable uh, if they do not deliver, and that these are not something Western. They're actually something quite compelling for everyone. So NDI and IRI are quite interesting because our organization's development and growth tracked this global democratic awakening. Um, it continues today. Uh, I just got back last night from Ukraine where both NDI and IRI had big missions observing the Ukrainian elections. We each deployed teams all over the country. So interesting in Ukraine, uh, there was lots of commentary that actually they trusted the international observers to monitor their elections more than they trusted the domestic observers or any of the Ukrainian institutions to monitor their election. We had over 2,000 international observers in Ukraine, and that helped deliver and ensure a very successful and credible election, right? So most of what we do is not election observation. Um, but I mention that partly because there is demand for this work out in the world. When America doesn't do this work, many people in the world wonder why we don't, uh, because they see a kinship with our free society. They want the same. Uh, freedom attributes, the same levels of democratic development. And in many of their countries, they need help with those building blocks. So I know we're going to mm -hmm. talk more about what the sure. building blocks are, et cetera. Right. Well, I want to pick up on one thing. And for the uninitiated, there's a Republican Institute and a Democratic Institute. So do you have to be a member of the Republican or Democratic Party to work for you guys? And how, just how does that partisan uh, label affect uh, you and your outlook? There is no litmus test. I think we, I'm sure we've had Republicans work for NDI, and I know we've had Democrats work for IRI. Uh, we are loosely affiliated with the Democratic Party. We have a separate board of directors. Um, 
you know, our board of directors are made up of Democrats. The chair is Madeleine Albright. Mm -hmm. The vice chair is Tom Daschle. Mm -hmm. So it, it, there is a Democratic Party lean, sure. but we are not directly controlled by the Democratic Party, nor do we have a litmus test for people who work for us. It's really about, and the work that we do doesn't simply support liberal parties overseas or any particular agenda overseas except democratic process. Mm -hmm. if, if, if folks overseas are committed to pro democratic process uh, and the mindsets of democracy, that's what we share, those types of experiences, and we're not making a judgment as to whether we work only with left or center, but anyone who's committed to that, that ideal. Same for you, Dan. So I would just add, um, again, I think we're just going to do a lot of yinging and yanging <laughs> here, but uh, the reason that there are two political party institutes is that the founders of the National Endowment for Democracy thought, well, gosh, what are the building blocks of a strong, successful democratic society? And their kind of back of the envelope answer was political parties, business community, and labor union movements, right? And so they created four core institutes. They created a democratic institute or Republican institute as the core political party institutes. Can't have real democracy without strong political parties. And then they created smaller uh, kind of pro-entrepreneurship and uh, labor union uh, uh, enterprises. Um, the work is not partisan at all. Uh, Senator John McCain was chairman of our board for 25 years. Uh, we hire lots of Democrats and independents, and actually both of us run what are essentially multinational organizations because huge numbers of people who work for IRI and NDI are not even American, much less Republican or Democrat or something else. Uh, so when I do an all staff meeting every week, I have people piped in from 40 offices around the world and I'm speaking to a lot of foreign nationals. And when I look out at my team in Washington, in fact, it is full of non-Americans and, you know, we appreciate that because of course, if you're going to do the kind of work we do in Bolivia or Zimbabwe or Malaysia, actually the people you need to be helping do that work in those countries are Malaysians, Bolivians and Zimbabweans, not people who look like us. No, I just say, just yeah. to build on that too, uh, that is the heart and soul of what we do. I mean, this is not about exporting America or exporting American democracy. It's about sharing democratic experiences uh, with people all over the world. And what the American experience is only one type of democratic experience. There are certain core principles of democracy that we talk about with civilian control, violence of power, we, you know, all these sure. civilian control, the military, all these things. But the, the face of democracy, the, the types of, are many. You know, we have a Kosovar working in Jordan. We've got uh, a Dutch uh, man working in Tunisia. We've got a Serb in Iraq. You know, this is how it works, or a Romanian in, in Morocco. I mean, this is how it, it operates. So, uh, and then people on the ground, we hire locals to do the work. So it's a remarkable amalgam and it's a representation of just how universal these values are. Mm -hmm. uh, and that they can share their own type of uh, context, which is unique context, maybe a lesser developed context, with others who are also going through a transitional context in a lesser developed context. I just jump on that. I remember when we were working at IRI, we had a young Serbian uh, youth activist who was working for us in Iraq. And I asked him how he found it. And he said, well, the, it, it's an advantage to have come from Serbia. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? He said, well, I." I know what's gunfire and what's not, and I know when to duck and when not. And so, <laughs> very useful. Sometimes somebody who's lived in a conflict environment can then take care of that and relate better to people who are in that environment. And particularly themselves. if you're going in, undergoing a transition and you yeah. know how difficult it is and you have forward and back and this challenge and these obstacles, someone who has gone through that and already thought through, worked through some of these challenges, it's, it's much more acceptable to folks overseas when they say, oh, you've been through it, you're like me. Okay, good, you can... But that leads me to my next question, which is, and, and this is a bit of a plug for you guys, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, so IRI and NDI have hired SICE students. They've also had s people from SICE, uh, or people who work for you have come to SICE, so it works both ways. Uh, what do you look for um, when you're hiring? And, and let me just add, I know you also hire foreign nationals and can help with visas, so you know, this is something that's appealing as some of these students are going to graduate. We want to make sure they all have, can pay off their student loans. Um, so what do they look for? What do you look for? So um, back in the day, maybe 20, 25 years ago, IRI hired a lot of kind of former campaign types, mm -hmm. at least among Americans. And then actually in terms of those Europeans and others who we work with, a lot of them had worked really in politics quite directly. 
uh, the landscape has changed. The lines of programming have changed. The world is much more democratic. We don't need kind of to run a campaign for democracy everywhere. Actually, in most countries, what we need to do is get democracy working a little better, mm -hmm. right? Uh, consolidate it, help it deliver for citizens. So a lot of the people we hire now are uh, development experts. They bring functional expertise. They may bring very compelling regional expertise, right, to be able to come to Indonesia and say, you know, I have worked in this country. I have a network. I have a sense of uh, how to connect with this culture, a set of language skills. Um, there's not one kind of person that we hire, uh, but we increasingly find that our work has become maybe more technical. It's mm -hmm. still obviously political. It's fundamentally political work but it's maybe less politicized than it was because so much of what we're talking about are kind of, again, the building blocks of decent, accountable, responsive governance. Right, right. And I echo that, I mean, it depends which level of job as well. I mean, if you're based here, it's one thing. If you're based in one of the, the offices overseas, it's another. Here, the main job is, is really to support the field work. So it's um, doing the budgets and it could be doing the proposals and ensuring they get the support they need. Um, so a regional, having a regional background, having knowledge of international affairs, having a feel for what the, the teams out in the field are going through is very important. Um, for folks who do the actual trainings or the, or the facilitation, then you'll need the real tangible. You want them to be activists or they want them to be politicals. Worked on Capitol Hill, so have a feel for how parliaments work. Um, so it really depends on the individual project work in political party development or done political or been in elections. The, probably the most important thing, though, for this type of work, in a way, and it's probably true about any NGO, in a way, which is mission-driven. You're not going to be paid a huge amount of money doing this work, um, but you, the passion for it, the passion that I think Dan has, that I have as well, for democracy, for... Um, what we do every day and what the mission is to help people realize, um, you know, basically it's about human dignity. Um, that, I think, is the most important thing we'll probably be looking for in someone, that they're willing to put in the hours, they have that passion, their commitment to the mission. Can I just add to yeah, that? Because, I, you know, um, we've worked in mission-driven organizations, and many of you probably have, but it's quite a thing. We get a lot of people who are either overqualified or they're going to be underpaid when they come to work at IRI because they were in the private sector or in some other kind of role that was not mission driven and they just felt like something was missing. Mm -hmm. And actually it's a fine thing to come to work every day um, and to be able to trust and collaborate so openly with a community of people who are all rowing in the same direction, who are all very like-minded. Mm -hmm. Makes a huge difference. Absolutely. And um, I would encourage all of you as you think about your next steps, not that you have to all be, you know, evangelical about whatever you do. Uh, but there's a big difference between doing something for a paycheck and doing something because it actually really animates and motivates you. Absolutely, but speaking of paychecks, so who pays for this? <laughs> I mean, I think that's a mechanical thing, but is this... Is Aside this, from we as president? How yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> obviously out of your yeah. own pocket. But like, so it's, it, who finances the work that you do and what's the process of getting the money? Is there scrutiny, transparency, accountability in some way? Uh, so uh, we are both competing, as are other democracy NGOs, for pr uh, primarily U.S. government funding in the foreign assistance accounts. In every, about every year uh, in the foreign aid budget, there's about $2.5 billion right now that's really broadly in the area of democracy rights and governance. Uh, we are competing for grant opportunities from the State Department, USAID uh, primarily for uh, those monies. Uh, there are also foreign governments that we work with, uh, Canada, Britain, Sweden, Australia, kind of big democratic governments that have democracy development as part of their uh, mission. Uh, there is some corporate support, some foundation support, but primarily we are talking about uh, a USG funding stream, uh, that, which means that we actually have enormous accounting and finance operations to uh, very carefully manage all of that taxpayer money because it is taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Same for you? It's the same. Can you say something about the National Endowment for Democracy? Because right. you mentioned them, and how do they fit into the picture? Well, in percentage terms, we can be very transparent about that. 50%, I think, of our budget is, comes from grants from USAID. Mm -hmm. uh, about 20 or 25%, I think, comes from the National Endowment for Democracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we have um, foreign funding, foreign governments or foundations and such, and then some private. Private's very small. 
We have mm -hmm. a gala every year. I'm trying to get some more fundraising working. But primarily, so it's 80 percent or so. I'm sorry, also DRL at State Department. So about 80 percent is U.S. government. And then we have to do some very careful accounting uh, to ensure that they know what we're doing with the money and that all the fiduciary responsibilities are protected. Um, the NED, we are core, we get I think 17 million automatically every year when the NED gets funded, if they get sort of the same line item, we get a certain percentage every year. Although they don't just give us 17 million bucks. They, no. no, they run it through. We have to, we have to <laughs> apply proposals. for it and do proposals and such. But we both compete for some money and then we have some core funding that we get from them that we then make proposals about what we want to do with it. Um, again, we, were, we came out of the same legislation, National Endowment for Democracy Act in 1983, that established the NED and established the two party institutes, labor and business institutes as well. Can I just mention one more thing yeah. about this funding structure? It's actually, there's a reason that the, founder, the founders set up NED, which is that actually diplomatically it can be very awkward for the U.S. government to walk in and support a great set of democracy activists in a closed society, right? So part of the idea with the National Endowment for Democracy was to slightly decouple the day-to-day -day operations of democracy work from the control of cautious bureaucrats, shall we say. Um, it creates a much more responsive and nimble structure for us to be able to work with the National Endowment for Democracy. We are not agents of the U.S. government. Uh, in fact, we are out working on democracy and freedom in some cases, you know, including in some societies where the U.S. may have a very cozy relationship with that dictator who's running that country. But so uh, part of the idea of having NGOs lead this work, NGOs like IRI and NDI, is that we can uh, have more impact, frankly. Mm -hmm. And we're very, very uh, protective of that independence. <laughs> That now we get grants, so we decide. We say this is what we're we're going to do. We will have flexibility to do it, mm -hmm. but we're very careful. We don't do contracts, which means we work directly for the government. They tell us what to do. We obviously coordinate with them. We have to make sure it's consistent that they're, you know, they know what we're looking to do, but we keep our independence uh, from from the government. So I was at IRI between 2002 and 2007, and Iraq was center stage. I'm thinking that many of the students, those were formative years, and so the impression that many of us got, uh, I think many people got in America about democracy assistance was really twinned with the high profile it took on in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah. And especially I think about George W. Bush's second inaugural where he really made it front and center. Which leads people to sometimes say, well, isn't this, you know, a neoconservative, right. you know, attempt to imperially remake the world, that sort of line. And I, I know enough to know it's not true, but I, I wanted to put it out there and, yeah. and say, you know, when you're talking about being independent from the government, how, how does U.S. foreign policy sometimes complicate your life and, and how would you characterize it separate from some of the charges from people don't know this as well? Right. Well, I mean, that's a challenge for us in everything we do because we are American organizations. Even if, as we say, most of the people that are doing the work overseas are not American and it's really a global operation. We are based in Washington. We get a lot of our funding from the U.S. government, so it can be seen as an American thing. Um, and the Iraq example, I think, really again, I worked here twenty. I worked at NDI twenty years ago. That was before then in these offices. I watched from afar when Iraq happened, and then when George W. Bush was talking about democracy promotion, and it was viewed as aggressive. It was viewed as ugly. It was viewed as imposing democracy. And I remember thinking, I couldn't work at NDI now <laughs> because it'd be so hard to make the case that you're not somehow, an, that democracy promotion is, is really about these countries and not about America. That it's about sharing and about being invited in versus being going in at the point of a spear, which is exactly what we're not mm -hmm. and what we want to be separated from. So uh, I think it was very damaging um, for us, for, for um, the institutes. And it's probably more damaging, as you suggest, for my side of the aisle. We still, work, we still have this problem that the left um, is probably more sensitive to this. And when they hear democracy promotion, they think, oh, Iraq. Uh, so I, we, I go to the Hill a lot because the money ultimately doesn't come from ND, a USAID or the NED. It comes from Congress. Mm -hmm. um, so we need support for what we do and understanding what we do. Um, so we go to the Hill all the time. So does Secretary Albright. And we're trying to go to some of the new um, liberal uh, representatives um, who we are proud of as Democrats, but who may have a different idea on this and say, no, it's not that, 
it is this. What they did was actually distorting what we do, and what we actually do is this. But it, it remains, I think, a conceptual obstacle for many for exactly the reasons you say. And I remember when we were in Iraq, one of the things is, is they had, because the Ba'ath Party was, was dissolved and denied a role in government, you had, you had people who were first elected in, in their first elections, they were very proud of them in Iraq, who had zero political experience, including a number of women who were you know, taking a role that other women in Middle e the Middle East did not get. And they wanted to learn how to make this work. They were in a new job, it was a bit scary, and they wanted some help. Um, that's sort of what I remember. Dan, how does this affect your work? How has it affected the business? Yeah. So, I mean, Iraq was a war fought for national security reasons, right? Um, what happened then is the United States and our allies discovered that the country needed to govern itself. And, of course, the planning for that was not very good. Um, the reason that uh, Iraq was such a shambles was because it had been a Ba'athist police state where Saddam Hussein was pulling out his critics' tongues and doing other unspeakable things. And so you then had, you went from kind of zero to 60 in terms of any form of democratic civil society. Yeah. Uh, you saw the same thing, by the way, in Egypt. I mean, there are lots of countries where this has happened. The latest is Algeria, where the, government, the president yesterday uh, just resigned in the face of millions of people in the streets. Right? So it doesn't just happen at the barrel of a gun. 99% uh, of the time, it doesn't happen at the barrel of a gun. And we're not part of the barrel of the gun approach. We're NGOs. Um, so uh, the problem in a lot of these societies is that that civic infrastructure is not there. What's interesting about Venezuela, I'm happy to keep going on the Middle East, but <laughs> what's interesting about Venezuela right now is that you have these civic networks. They exist. You have underground media. You have the National Assembly, which is a legitimately constituted mm -hmm. in institution under the Venezuelan Constitution, which is a democratic institution, mm -hmm. right? And so Venezuela has been a narco dictatorship for the past few decades. But in fact, you have a genuine democratic civil society underneath it. And if that country really does have a political change, right. uh, there will be a lot to work with there. In a country like Iraq or a country like Egypt, when Mubarak fell in the face of street protests, that civic underpinning was not there. Right. And so a lot of the work that NDI and IRI do uh, actually is to invest in these civic structures even when people are living under one-party states. Mm -hmm. Because sooner or later, people take to the streets and want something different. And you don't want a scenario like Iraq, where you're literally starting from scratch. Right. Um, so one last question about general, and then I do want to talk about some of the specific interesting countries now. They're all interesting. but um, And that is, you know, after the Bush administration, the Obama administration, I think there was some sense that maybe democracy assistance would would fall in priority. Um, certainly, we didn't know what to make of the Trump administration and their attitudes. There did seem to be some desire to pull back from some policies. How, what have you seen uh, in the last 16 years, or I will just say the last 10, in terms of the U.S. government's attitude on this business? Is it a growth business? Is it a collapsing business? Um, where are we? Do you want I mean, there's increasing recognition. The U.S. spends an enormous amount of money, not enormous as a percent of the budget, but enormous in real dollars, on foreign assistance. Most of that does not go to democracy, rights, and governance. Most of that goes to humanitarian catastrophes, uh, uh, feeding starving people, vaccinating children, worthy causes. Only a small fraction of that U.S. foreign assistance goes to the long-term investments in helping to build sustainable societies. And of course, you know what happens to all that money that we give for emergency purposes. I mean, think about the Rohingya refugee crisis in Burma. Uh, or think about the situation in South Sudan, the situation in Syria, the situation in Venezuela, these enormous refugee flows uh, spurred by conflict, sparked by uh, failed governance. Uh, those societies are not ever going to be healthy without some decent governing structures. And so we can continue to help starving people and refugees uh, or, it's not either or, but actually we could make some sound investments in helping countries govern themselves a little better, create some rule of law, some order. In Central America, uh, desperate people have been fleeing gangster societies where security and basic law have just totally broken down. Many of them are fleeing for the United States. The solution, I would argue, is to invest in the rule of law and municipal governance and other things so that people feel safe and don't feel like they need to flee yeah. to the United States. So. Uh, it, the direct answer to your question, or the indirect answer, is that I think there is a growing awareness of how these tools work. 
uh, more broadly, the Congress has continued to support this work. And the mm -hmm. Congress, at the end of the day, is in charge of the budgets, as Derek says. Right. So whoever is the president actually has a more limited influence than, than the majority in Congress. Mm -hmm. That's reassuring. Uh, Derek? I mean, do we need to answer each question? I, mean, I can no, certainly no, no, talk about it. Just give But I, no, I, I agree that, I mean, uh, that I think there is uh, momentum on the side of democracy and understanding. I think most people in this town, unfortunately, even those in CSIS who we used to work, yeah, yeah. they don't understand really what NDI or IRI do. Mm -hmm. They kind of know about us, generally the sense, well, they do election stuff, right? But we need to, and we're thinking about this very strategically and thoughtfully, how do we get this into the bloodstream so it's not a nice thing, though it is a nice thing, Oh, it's just a humanitarian or soft thing, though a humanitarian it is. But it truly does have impact. It has impact on the ability of countries to deal with health crises. With, it prevents migration, uh, mass migrations, or it deters that. Or it, it, it deters extremism. All these things cross borders. They have real tangible strategic and security components to them, mm -hmm. where what we do is supporting people to have a say in their own affairs, and that in and of itself is a stabilizing force inside countries. Um, making that connection, I think there's a window now that there hasn't been in a while. Mm -hmm. Because in some way, because of uh, this administration, um, as well as um, a lot of the think tanks in town are doing programs on this type of thing and thinking about democracy work. I do agree with you. I think uh, President Obama, who I was a strong supporter of, uh, and obviously was in his administration, I think they de-emphasized it in a reaction to Iraq and a reaction to what happened mm -hmm. with Bush. Uh, which was unfortunate. You don't react simply to what came before. There is just certain goods. But even people in that administration now are starting to recognize and talk about how important this component of the American toolbox is, or the or the you know international toolbox is for international security. So I think we need to do much more why we're here and why we do want to do more of this of explaining the connections mm -hmm. uh, between what we do and the broader foreign policy interests of the U.S. and our allies. We both already tapped into this, so I'm going to just go into sort of a speed round, if you're ready for this. <laughs> Talk about some of the circumstances where I know you guys are on the front lines, and maybe you can give us some insight as to what's going on. So first, Dan, you raised it in the first instance, Venezuela. Where are we, and how are the countries around Venezuela being affected in terms of their governance by the crisis there? So uh, as many refugees have come out of Venezuela as have come out of Syria, over the last eight years of war. It's worth mm. thinking about that for a second, because there is no war in Venezuela, right? There are not suicide bombers, there's not ISIS, but it has produced a, an, a similarly destabilizing mm -hmm. phenomenon. Uh, Venezuela is actually even more shocking, because this was the richest country in Latin America. This is a country that's swimming in oil wealth. This is a country that had, in many, in the capital, certainly like American standards of living 20, mm -hmm. 30 years ago, right? Um, so this is an example. I mean, I think Venezuelan GDP has been cut in half over the last either five or ten years. Uh, mm -hmm. This is not just a country that's stagnating. This is a country that's walked over a cliff, right? In the richest country in, in Latin America, 90% of people, 90% of people don't have enough to eat. And it's not because they don't have farmers or resources. It's because they have been so terribly governed mm -hmm. by an elite that has stolen uh, from them and run the country into uh, the ground. So uh, in some ways, Venezuela, I hate to say it, is a useful example intellectually of what happens even outside of a conflict scenario mm -hmm. uh, when you have this, this kind of narcissistic kleptocratic regime. So uh, what is happening, uh, very interestingly, Juan Guaido, uh, the democratically anointed leader, uh, he is the legitimate president under the Venezuelan constitution written by the former dictator Hugo Chavez. So the former mm -hmm. dictator changed the constitution and created a scenario where the Speaker of Parliament could become president in the event of a vacancy in the presidency. Maduro, the current uh, uh, proclaimed ruler, ran a fake election. Uh, actually, arguably, under the, under the Venezuelan constitution, is not the anointed leader. And so Venezuela, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot to work with there in terms of that democratic infrastructure. People desperate for a change, but a hugely destabilizing effect, particularly on Colombia in the neighborhood. And that, I think that's really important to, to just to add on all of that. I was in Colombia in December. I met actually with some national assemblymen who came out to talk, including Guaido, uh, in December. Um, but the impact on Colombia, which is a itself had undergone internal civil war for many, many years, and they were the destabilizing factor for Venezuela for a long time. But now you have the reverse. Now you have Venezuela and Venezuelan uh, refugees 
going into Colombia and putting enormous stress on Venezuela, which can have an impact on a very um, a tenuous transition inside Colombia. And we, this is a bipartisan success. There was something called Plan Colombia between Democrats and Republicans starting in the late 90s that really created a stable, successful place um, in Colombia uh, that is now in transition. But this stress from refugees in Venezuela can tip things. It can create instability. So this is not just a Venezuelan problem. It's a regional security problem. And you get, there's drugs involved. There's uh, all kinds of, um, uh, there's terrorism involved. There's, um, you know, you name it. There, this is a, it could be a, a nexus of international instability. Ukraine, you were just there, Dan, and I know you've been there, Derek. Yes. How, how is Ukraine doing after their election this last weekend? Obviously, they still have pushback from Russia. So Ukraine, well, Ukraine is very interesting, right? Yeah. This, is a, this is a core part of the former Soviet empire. Russia's civilization, Rus, was founded in Kiev. I mean, mm -hmm. Ukraine is the core of Russian civilization, the core of the Russian Orthodox Church. It began in Kiev. Um, Ukrainians want something really different. They don't want to be part of any new Russian empire, right? Uh, the top three candidates, actually all the leading candidates in this race, including the top three, this presidential contest they just had, wanted to move the country towards the West into Euro-Atlantic institutions like NATO and the EU. So Putin, the Kremlin invaded Ukraine in 2014, as you remember, seized Crimea, is now occupying the Donbas, which is about 12% of Ukraine's population. Um, Russia has lost Ukraine. Actually, it used to be a much more divided country than it is. Uh, this is a country at war. 13,000 soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers, have been killed on the front. Uh, the war has lasted longer than World War I. Think about that for a minute. Uh, yet they just had a very credible election in which Ukrainians came out. It was peaceful. Uh, it was a fair election, 64% uh, turnout. They now have a presidential runoff. This is quite an accomplishment for a society in the midst of war. Absolutely. The biggest issues were the war and corruption in the economy. And so all of the candidates were basically running on those big platforms. Mm -hmm. But it, that's, this is emblematic of the challenge for democracy and what we do. It's more than elections, and the election was very good. And there'll be a second round coming in, in three weeks. But um, the ability, they, they had this great moment. Facebook actually helped. This is when they had Facebook helped in the old days for the... Um, the, um, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Euromaidan. Yeah. Euro uh, Euro uh, and people came out because they communicated via Facebook and they brought down the dictator in Ukraine. Um, so everyone has this great euphoria. They think, okay, we have a democratic moment. Poroshenko gets in. And even though actually some things have gotten better in Ukraine, overall, people feel it's, it's poor, extremely poor, extremely corrupt, and their expectations have not been met. So people are getting frustrated. They want democracy, but they want fairness, and they want equity, and they want economic development, and they want jobs, and they're expecting now this leader to deliver it, and he hasn't delivered it. Um, he's done better than his predecessor, but it's not up to the expectation, so then people get frustrated. And as you heard, I'm sure if you read the papers, maybe some of you haven't followed, but the one who won the, this round of the elections, there'll be a runoff, is a comedian who has absolutely no experience in government. Uh, he played a, someone, a teacher on TV, who became president, called Servant of the, Peop of the People. So he played a t president on TV <laughs> with no political experience and because people just want something different. And I think we kind of understand that as Americans, whoever is American in this room. But they want the kind of president that he plays on TV, which yeah. is a tough corruption fighter who stands up to the oligarchs yes. and stands up to the Russians. Of course. And, that they want that in real life. Of course they do, but it's not that easy. You know, and, and doing that takes certain skill, political skill, and all that. We'll see what happens if he wins. But so the desire is there. The unity is there against Russia, as, as Dan said. They're never more unified than they, than they were, you know, before against Russia for democracy. Um, you know, uh, the civil society is developing, but the expectations are high. So we've seen a lot of these things happen. Tunisia, the Arab Spring, other places where then, okay, what comes after? People have high expectations. If those expectations aren't met, then they may say, you know what, democracy is not delivering. And then somebody says, you know what, only I could fix this. Give me the power. I'll do this for you. You know, that didn't work. That's too messy. Democracy is difficult. It's messy. It creates more problems. Mm -hmm. Let me do it. Give me all the power, and I'll do it instead. Or he gets in, or she gets in, typically he, and then takes, starts to chip away at judicial power or media power or changes the Constitution. And then you have a, somebody who we can talk about this, has mm -hmm. democracy in form, but not democracy in fact. So you may have elections, you may have media, you may have you know, a judiciary, but it's all controlled. 
And so they start, these folks are starting to catch up and play the game of democracy without actually being a democracy, in fact. There are a couple of uh, breakthroughs, but also question marks over African development. And you mentioned Africa earlier. I'm wondering what you think the situation in, in Congo is, um, where we had a disputed election, the church liked one candidate, it's all quite messy. Gabon, where we saw the president resign and then not resign and then resign again. You know, you have all of that transition. Mali, Liberia, some of the star <laughs> candidates which we've been hopeful for uh, for a while are, are in turmoil. What, what, so there are a couple big things going on in Africa. One is just a demographic boom. Africa is going to double in population in the next 25 years. And by the year 2100, there are going to be 4 billion Africans, 4 billion with a B. Mm. So there was this enormous cohort. Um, the, I can't remember if this is the average or the median age, because Derek keeps telling me I'm getting this wrong. Either the average <laughs> or the median age in Africa is 19, yeah. OK, median. in sub-Saharan Africa. Everybody is young, but the politicians are not young. Uh, so we together observed, ran a big joint NDI-IRI observation mission for the Nigerian elections. They had uh, presidential and parliamentary, and then they had gubernatorial state elections. So we were there together. Um, in Nigeria, uh, the two men, inevitably, running for president, between them had run nine times before. Uh, they were both well over 70, over 70. Uh, totally unreflective of this young, teeming, dynamic society. In Nigeria, which of course is half women, only 6% of the parliament had female MPs, were female MPs, right? So 94% men in parliament. Nigeria is a democracy, uh, but there is so much work to do. And across Africa, what you see is young people who want something really different than the old strong men who I grew up as a kid under in Africa. Uh, they are digitally empowered because they have phones. They know what happens in the wider world. They are often quite savvy and sophisticated, but they are still being underserved in so many countries by old leaders. We were also together, IRI and NDI, in Zimbabwe for their elections last summer. And there you had a very vibrant democratic opposition. You had political rallies with 20,000 people in the streets in the big cities hoping for change, young people really turning out for change, and they ended up after a flawed election with uh, an old man who essentially was the inheritor from Mugabe of the ruling party. So there's this disjunct that you see in many of these countries. There are positive trends, though, which I think is this kind of more youth activism, uh, a much more modern way of thinking, and a sense that uh, it's time for young people to be more involved. There are also worrisome trends, and I'll stop, include, particularly militancy and Islamic extremism in the Sahel, including in Mali, including in northern Nigeria, including in uh, a range of countries. Uh, ISIS has been defeated militarily in Syria and Iraq, but increasingly that activity is moving to this undergoverned region, uh, which is this fringe uh, of Africa along the Sahara Desert. Wow. We just underscore that theme, youth and women. If there's anything that, it's a theme through many different regions, and you know, it's Africa or Southeast Asia or the Middle East. Um, Young people are, I mean, the vast majority are under 30 or under 25. In Africa, median 19, average age of leaders, it's true in the Middle East, over 70. So that's an opportunity, in a way. If we get to the issue of mindsets, mindsets are not going to change at a certain point. Folks are going to do what they do if they're of a certain age and used to certain ways of, of politicking. The key is to kind of break that cycle. And you can try and do that, I think, with younger people who want something different, they're going to have to, we have to create jobs for them, we have to find something to do um, for them. Um, so how do you channel? They're also not interested in political parties. We're finding the interest in political parties is going down. But political participation is going up. Uh, women's political participation is going up. Even as people talk about a crisis in democracy, the actual desire to have a say in public affairs is going up, youth and women, I think even more and just broadly. The question is, how do you channel that? How do you organize, given that we have a digital society, we have a digital society coming, and young people are, just don't feel like they want to use the old systems, the old ways. So how do you do political organization, vice political parties, per se? Um, how do you ensure that there is space for women to be involved, because that can break the cycle of traditional male autocracy? And how do you get young people to be involved and interested and demand that they should have a say in their own affairs and they shouldn't be led by people three generations above who are just doing the same old, same old. The elections in Nigeria, we kept hearing over and over this, we're looking past this election. You know, we're looking at 2019. 
It's two folks who are over 70. They're the old guard. They're going to do things the same old way. We're not going to get any change from them. We've got to look to the next election. And I think, frankly, we're already doing it. I'm already thinking about that at NDI. Project 2023 Nigeria, basically. What do we need to do to help them between now and then have a new moment? And what happens, and I think also very important to think about, there are certain countries where it's really important to get in the right momentum, that it can ripple out. You know, the smaller countries will look to the bigger countries, major countries. I mean, Venezuela is critical, but Colombia is critical in that regard. Nigeria is important in its atmosphere, uh, in, its, you know, in its area. Uh, Ukraine, I think, would be very important. Uh, Tunisia in, in uh, North Africa. So I think you focus on some of these really specific challenges that go beyond the typical institution process. I'm going to pick on you, Dan, again. Uh, you know, you were ambassador to Myanmar, Burma. No, I'm trying to be fair. Uh, no, but no, 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 yeah. as, you, um, as you were there, I witnessed to the situation. Many of us were very excited by Aung San Suu Kyi and the, the, <laughs> the apparent change in the junta's attitude. Where are we now there? And, and what went wrong and what can still be fixed? If that's a big agenda. It's a big agenda. We could have a whole conference on this. And I, um, I met Aung San Suu Kyi when I worked at NDI in the 90s, when I worked here. I remember talking about it in this room and did a film with her and, yeah, we gave her a democracy award. Everyone had, I think, had put great hopes mm -hmm. in her because she was iconic and, and represented the democratic hope of the country. I think she still represents to the people of the country the hope, mm -hmm. uh, the, the potential of the country. Uh, but they're still in transition. I think she had told me when I was ambassador very early on, quietly, she said, you know, I'm, I'm a politician. I'm not an icon, I'm a politician. Which I respected, that icons are sort of up here on a pedestal and they don't get their hands dirty. But I thought, oh, nothing wrong about being a politician uh, at all. But of course, she represented more than a politician. People were hoping that she would rise above normal politics because she was such a unique figure. Uh, the daughter of the founder of the country, um, the, the representation of lost promise when her father was assassinated on the eve of independence. Her father was basically the Abraham Lincoln and the George Washington of the country. And he and his associates were, were murdered just months before they got independence from, from the Brits. So she represented something just unique. And I think we all had hoped that she would rise to that. And there's still, we'll have to see how things turn out. But she's turned out to be more of a politician than, than, um, than we had hoped, I think, in that regard. And less of a visionary than a politician. Um, and there's, the country is still in transition when it comes to democracy. Uh, even with the, this is an example where democracy is not just about an election. I was there for the election in 2015. It's a critical election. Uh, her party won a landslide, and she became leader of the country, or de facto leader. Um, but nothing changed, really. The, the military she just meant that she owned all the problems of the country that came before. The Constitution didn't change. The military still had control of the security of the country. They still had economic prerogatives. They still had a quarter of the parliament. So she was hemmed in. Um, and, and they still had the longest running civil war in the world, which is an incredibly difficult task to hold this place together. Still incredible underdevelopment. Uh, and still tensions between Muslims and, and um, Buddhists or Christians as well. Um, so the, the challenges that she faces is enormous. And we have to be patient with the challenges that, of Burma, of Myanmar. But um, it's fair to say that, that she probably hasn't risen to the occasion to the point that we would have wanted to see and that many, frankly, of our country, men and women, have also wanted to see. That said, it's very likely she will win. Her party will win a plurality at least next year in elections in 2020. Um, but it'll be probably less of a, a big victory because there really is no alternative. I mean, right now, there's no political alternative that people feel um, they can invest in. Mm -hmm. Dan, I'm going to... Uh, take you to another part of the world, and that is Turkey. We saw interesting elections yeah. just recently, and, and maybe the feeling that the uh, Erdogan era is, uh, is, is shifting ground a bit. Um, where do you see Turkey? And for that matter, because of Turkey's close connections with Europe, Germany, and elsewhere, how do you see support for democracy assistance among our European allies? So Turkey is in a category I would also include a country like Hungary and a country like the Philippines in it right now, which is mm -hmm. where a leader takes office through democratic elections and then uses his authority over time to hollow out countervailing democratic institutions. Um, 
what happened in Turkey, what has happened is Erdogan has been ruling there for a long time in an increasingly authoritarian matter uh, to the point where there's a real break with NATO. Turkey is a core founding member of the NATO alliance. Uh, but increasingly there is talk about it being anything but a good ally because of its associations with Russia, because of its democracy breakdown, uh, because of its uh, pursuit of countervailing interests in the Middle East. So what just happened there were municipal elections in which the opposition won all the big cities. Another place where this recently happened was Poland, where you have a conservative, a socially conservative, traditional ruling party governing the country, pulling it in some ways uh, further away from European Union norms. But Poland, like Turkey, had elections in which kind of a more uh, liberal opposition took power in the big cities. Um, the opposition in Turkey now, it, assuming the ruling party is contesting the results in several of the cities, but assuming that the results hold, the opposition in Turkey will control the cities that produce 70% of Turkey's GDP, 70, 70. And there's lots of patronage networks between politicians and business in Turkey. So really the opposition will play this very foundational role in that country's political and economic life going forward. Erdogan is very sensitive to this because he rose to power by being mayor of Istanbul and leveraging that platform into a national platform that allowed him to uh, uh, assume executive authority. So uh, lots to watch here, but really it's a reminder to us. I mean, a core part of the work that we're doing is trying to create balance in democracies. There is a problem in many democracies of an imbalance of executive authority, right? And so part of our investments in parliaments, in municipal governance is to create that kind of balance. In Ukraine, we do a lot of polling in Ukraine. And one of the great takeaways is that Ukrainians are totally fed up with politicians in the capital. They think they're all corrupt. They want to overthrow the ruling elite, hence their vote for this comedian. But in fact, when you poll about uh, how is your city council doing, how's your mayor doing, Ukrainians are overwhelmingly very positive because there are real reforms. Ukraine had a decentralization reform go through a few years ago that empowered mayors. Okay. And so increasingly, I mean, there's a conversation in the United States about how governance increasingly is devolving, right? Washington, D.C. is not the center of governance anymore for most Americans. It's their governors, their mayors, their townships. You're seeing this trend around the world. And actually, it's an encouraging one for democracy, I would argue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that, that is a smorgasbord of topics that should give you all a chance to jump in and, and ask questions about the business, about particular countries. The amazing thing about working with both of these gentlemen, but also your predecessors, as I've seen it over the years, is they become like super encyclopedias of everything <laughs> happening everywhere. And so many of us, like, I study Canada, how hard is that? But I have my little country that I cover, and that's all I have to master. And these guys have pretty much got to be conversant because you're going to talk to the world leaders of these countries, and you can't come in like a rookie. So an amazing opportunity. Let me turn to the audience, sir. Oh, oh, there's the a microphone, microphone mic. only because they've got the recording. That way the... Tell us yeah. who you are and where you're from. Yeah. Oh, Hi. yes. Very okay. important. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm Chang Wu. I'm uh, the MIPP student in the China Studies. Uh, my question is about the China issue. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, in the American diploma diplomacy, uh, there's an uh, expectation that, like, the economic growth can lead to the eventually democratization, and that is the basic uh, uh, foundation of the U.S.-China relationship. And we always uh, we we did witness some marginal uh, development in terms of uh, democracy in China. Uh, but however, in recent years, we have kind of witnessed uh, that uh, it it has been declining. Like uh, increasingly, the democracy has been framed by the Communist Party of China to be kind of a foreign interference or imperialist kind of things. And we did witness that in the periphery of China, like uh, no, no matter is Hong Kong or Xinjiang, and we, we did see the uh, liberty and uh, democracy has been a human right issue. So uh, what do you think that uh, are, are, the, are the institutes like, like yours, uh, this kind of soft democratization can still play a role in China, or maybe, maybe we have to think about even uh, more uh, kind of hardline kind of uh, methods. 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hardline methods. I'm not sure what you mean by hardline methods. We, we think of hardline methods. What, 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 can you define what you mean by that? Like a trade war. Oh, a trade war of getting change in China, you mean, through those methods. Um, I don't know that people had a, that American policy and strategy towards China was based on using economics to, to drive democratic change. I don't think that was the, the goal. I think that the view was, there is a th theory that um, through economic development, and some people think you have to have a middle class to have democracy, and I don't believe that myself. I think people desire to have a say in their own affairs. If given a chance, they will grab the ability to organize and have, have a voice. But there is that view that as economics or economies grow, that people will naturally then demand information, demand to have a say to protect their rights in that process. And as countries develop, they will demand uh, ability to speak more freely. Um, and they'll need information as well to do the kind of investment and uh, business that allows them to develop. So that's a theory as to how political change can naturally evolve inside a country. The demand really comes from within. Um, and I think, you, as you're suggesting, that was, I think, happening and maybe still is happening in China. Or as people are more, uh, get more development, more exposure, they want to have a say. They want to be online. They want to speak. Now, do they demand to vote for their leaders? Do they demand to have separate political party from the Communist Party? Um, so competing parties and all of that. I think, so far, China has able, been able to keep that down through aggressive measures, uh, through deterring folks from doing that and saying, look, just be quiet, we'll make you rich. And if you get your money, then don't worry about this political stuff, we'll take care of that. Um, but whether you can keep that desire for free speech um, and for you know, rule of law, true rule of law down, remains to be seen. Now, the China, what China is doing, this gets into a whole other realm of challenge for democracy worldwide. And China is exporting this which is the surveillance state, which is the ability to see what everyone's doing and get inside everybody's life, almost like Orwell was thinking, that in every room, every place, someone is watching you, and someone is keeping tabs on you, and you will be held accountable, and you will get social demerits, or you, will be, you won't be able to travel, you won't be able to get work, you won't be able to get benefits, if, you, if the government or the all-seeing eye decides that you are not doing what the government wants you to do. And technology is allowing that in a way that we haven't seen ever. And China is now, there's sort of surveillance in a box. They're exporting that to places overseas, which means that kind of headwind to democracy is probably more severe than we have ever experienced. It will be a huge, severe headwind for China uh, going forward of, of liberalizing. How people respond to that will be very interesting uh, going forward. But um, I would challenge, I think, the premise that the United States' goal is to democratize China, and therefore our trade policies and our security policies and everything is about changing China. That's just, I, that's just, I, truly, that's not the case. So Derek's a diplomat. Luckily, I'm not. Um, <laughs> you know, I think China's going backwards. In the 21st century, you have a one-man system, right? And I don't understand how this is possible. In the 21st century, where economic growth is driven by innovation, you have a system where people can't access the global internet, they cannot read the New York Times or use Google or kind of access the broad ability, the broad spectrum of information outside of China. And I don't understand how this is sustainable. Uh, China is very interesting because, of course, people look at the Chinese development model as being entirely unique, except that it's not unique because it's the same thing that other Asian countries went through after 1945 in terms of a one party system. Uh, using its control of capital to industrialize, right, to produce for export. Over time, we saw what happened in countries like South Korea and Taiwan that had similar one-party systems. Over time, they did open up that political reform had to follow economic reform when society got to a certain point in development. Uh, China's only just entered this middle-income range of $10,000 per capita. It's only just gotten there. Right, And most of these transitions happened in this ten to $20,000 per capita income range. So really, on the, the relationship between democracy and economy in China, we're only at the beginning of this period when you would expect to see some kind of political change. Um, I'm actually still pretty optimistic. You know, I was reading my history the other day. The, during the Chinese Civil War, 
one of the great critiques by Mao and the CCP of the nationalists, the Kuomintang and Chiang Kai-shek, was that they were autocratic and that the CCP would be a truly democratic force in Chinese society, right? <laughs> um, so I actually think that's still relevant, that actually the way to realize the full potential of the Chinese people and the Chinese nation is to have people enjoy the same political rights as they have economic rights. And I think Derek's point about the export of this China, Chinese surveillance state is very powerful because China under its current leadership is positioning itself uh, really to entrench autocracy in other countries in a way that there will be a counter reaction in those countries to Chinese influence. Uh, just like during the Cold War when America selectively supported dictators in Latin America and there was a popular backlash against that over, th over time. Right? So China will, as it becomes a global power, will bump into the same conflicts of do you support the dictator or do you stand with the people? Absolutely. Other questions? Uh, gentleman here and then the young lady at the back. And we'll come right to you. Hi, I'm, I'm Sam David, of course, I'm a first year MA student uh, in the International Law Organizations Program. And just for full disclosure, I used to work for IFAS uh, before this. Um, so my question's a bit inside baseball, but um, I was wondering if you could talk about how how institutions like NDI and IRI and, and, and also IVIS can balance the uh, need to continue as an institution to continue to get funding with also having innovative programming. Certainly, I, you know, I saw in my time, there's a lot of competition over the scarce resources that were coming in through funding mechanisms um, that I think led to more ineffective proposals or ineffective programming. So I was wondering, you know, is the current funding mechanisms adequate for the type of work and how do you balance the needs of the institution versus the needs of effective programming? Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard question, but it's a, a very, very good one. Because we have donors, they will come up with what they want. And they will, and therefore you do, and it can be very traditional type of things because they've gotten used to doing things a certain way. Um, and the way they've developed their proposals in some ways is because of what we had driven early on in our in NDI and IRI's existence. Because it didn't exist. We started with NED to do certain types of piloting program. It demonstrated success, and then AID says, oh, we're going to fund those same programs. Then you're kind of stuck with a cookie cutter type of programming model. So I coming in, I've only been on the job now, what, seven months, I guess. Um, you know, yes, you, ha you do have to you know, um, accommodate to some degree what the funder wants and what their view is of a program, good program. But I want us to be shaping the funders, shaping the donors. I mean, I want to go in there saying, what do we want to get? What, what is the right way to achieve our objective? What are we not doing? What are innovative ways to do these things? And then help them think it through so that when they put out a proposal, it's actually strategic and thoughtful and context specific, and that we're not just simply doing what they want us to do and we're a bureaucracy. We're just chasing money. Uh, that can happen. And I, you know, I won't lie, I'm sure there's folks, many folks in my organization who might do that because you, you have to keep yourself going. Uh, but, um, I don't want every program to be successful, and yet we don't achieve the mission of helping democracy. Mm -hmm. That's a bureaucracy, and that's what I'm afraid of. In this room, we used to have the uh, weekly um, staff meetings, and it used to be a joke that whenever someone would raise their hand and talk about their program, they'd talk about it was highly successful. We did such and such, and it was highly successful. We kind of laugh, okay, highly successful program. But as a not a joke is that you can have a highly successful program individually, but then the democracy or the the mission actually doesn't succeed because democracy doesn't take hold. So you're missing something. And I want to make sure that when we're doing programs, we're actually helping the mission of, of assisting these countries to institutionalize and provide the foundation for democratic development over the long term. And to do that, I think we need to be cutting edge in our thinking, cutting edge in our programming and our concept, and then shape the donors out there so that they come back to us and we work with them in shaping the type of things that we do. We had a 25-year period after the end of the Soviet Union, as you know, where essentially we didn't have competition. Um, it was an open field for democracy work. There's now real competition in the world again, and authoritarians are innovating in all sorts of ways, including using new technologies, including by cooperating. Um, the democracy community needs to innovate and out-innovate those authoritarians, including those authoritarians inside open societies who want to take those countries backward. So we're constantly trying to push the limits on trying out new innovative strategies. Of course, the problem there is you don't have a track record because you're trying to do something brand new. There are all sorts of things we could do with technology. I mean, I'd say in the last 10 years, bad guys have used technology much more effectively than good guys out in the world. But really, these tools 
should support openness and pluralism. They should not support dictatorship and one-party systems or one-man systems. So that's a big area. When we think about innovating, we think about creating digital democracy applications that can actually promote freedom. I mean, that's a big uh, assignment, I think, for us in our community. Ma'am. Uh, hi, uh, Maya Gaynor. I'm a second year uh, MA student in international development. And I wanted to circle back to one country that was raised briefly but not really discussed, which is the DRC. Um, and I'm very interested in how organizations that support democracy can respond to a highly flawed or disputed result, um, especially in the sort of immediate aftermath of a flawed election, to maintain you know, peace and security while also trying to push back against a government that's trying to distort the results and ensuring that the public doesn't feel that you know, the system has failed them. Right. Mm. Well, you have to be creative in that regard, as you say. We weren't there for that election, um, NDI wasn't. We have somebody who works at DRC, I think the person is in DRC. Um, that's an example you know, where you know, people have sort of moved on. I mean, unfortunately, there was a very flawed uh, election result. The election seemed to have a result that reflected well the people. Uh, from all indications, it went to Fuyulu, I think is the name, right? And then, but um, he didn't take over. And people, sort of the governments accepted that and moved on. So we have to operate in that environment where that's the reality of today. Um, you know, we're not in the business of subverting anything or doing anything like that. So we're working with the realities of the situation. So we're thinking about, is there a way, because we have relationships, the key for what we do is relationships, building trust. We're working in the most uh, sensitive part of a country. It's not building a well, which everyone believes in. It's politics and in in power and there's money involved. You know, that is the most sensitive part of a society. So we have to build relationships. We want to keep those relationships going for moments like this, where we can go, for instance, potentially to, um, to the leadership and say, you know what, we all know that didn't go very well. There's a potential here for instability in your country. Maybe there's some things you can do from here to the next election to be a bridge for a democratic change inside the country and try and build maybe bridges between civil society and this government or do other things that start Again, it's not just about elections, it's about building some kind of process and mindset of, of openness, of transparency, of some accountability, and in convincing that, the leader um, to, uh, to think about his tenure differently, think about how he governs differently in a more democratic way, and then therefore start a democratic process even after a result of an election that was very suspect and democratically. So, just to add to Derek's answer, obviously the history of, Congo, of DRC didn't start with that election. I mean, just to rewind a little bit, Congo in the 90s was ground zero for a great war in Africa where more people were killed than in World War I, right? A rebel leader ended up taking Kinshasa and running that country. His son then became the ruler. Uh, his son was supposed to have had elections two years ago, never did. Actually, just having any kind of transition in Congo was better than having uh, somebody occupying the presidency illegitimately. Um, uh, it was a contested election. There were something like 90 militia groups operating in the country. Big parts of the country were disenfranchised because they didn't even attempt to have a vote there, right? I mean, we know about all the problems. Um, one takeaway, certainly for us, was the role of domestic observers. The Catholic Church had something like 40,000 observers across the country, Congolese, who witnessed, who ran a parallel vote count, essentially, and witnessed the fact that the winner, as declared in the Capitol, was not the actual guy who won the election, according to their tally. Uh, that was powerful. Uh, we have a lot of work to do. I mean, arguably, having an election in the absence of the kind of civic structures, I mean, all the kind of work that we need to do in between elections. Donors get very focused on funding election. We were there for an election assessment, IRI, for this mission. We do have a, a team there. Uh, but in fact, the work in Congo is not work around elections. It's around that basic foundational structure of how to have a democracy in a functioning state, which arguably DRC, it's not only not particularly democratic, it's not a particularly functioning state. So there's huge amounts of work to do there. And the country is vast, right? The country is the size of Western Europe. And so when you're in the democracy business and you're operating on grants worth $500,000 or $1 million a year, you've got to think about how you're going to affect change in a country like that, and it's hard. 
I'll just draw something out of that because what's interesting is that there are countries that IRI takes the lead in and other countries NDI takes the lead in just to use the resources efficiently and not split them. It's just the reality of the business and in that sense fairly interchangeable. I think you both pursue the same thing. So the gentleman here. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to, um, I'm Bat uh, Patulga from Mongolia. So uh, you uh, covered some extreme case, extreme countries, but I'm um, from Mongolia, one of the advanced you know, democracies among its peers, although not complete. Um, I had a chance to work with IRI when I was in Mongolia. And um, one observation, I, the IRI team there is very successful, projects are very successful, but one observation I had was that projects and then funding for projects were very cyclic based on election seasons and there are a lot of uh, you know, resources and projects um, in the elect elect election seasons, but not so much in the non-election seasons. And you talked about um, innovative approaches, but I also think that sustainability and continuity of projects for in international development and governance um, are important. So what um, are, is your take on that? Um, I, I, yeah, that's I mean, we've had an office in UB since like 1992, so there has been some continuity, right? But your point is correct that we're operating on one or two year government grant cycles um, and constantly trying to renew those. Um, uh, we do a lot of work in Mongolia now with young leaders. I mean, investing in that next generation, your generation, and kind of their hopes for the future, less on elections per se. Um, but yes, it is partly the nature of the funding cycle that it's cyclical that way, indeed. Mm -hmm. The, sure. Uh, well, all I will say is that there are cycles in every organization, in every area of government. One of the cycles that you probably don't know about because we don't have little bells that ring is that there's another round of classes that starts at two, which is why we've lost a few people. So let me <laughs> make that our last question. <laughs> I went to Fletcher. Is, we didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fletcher. George. Fletcher. Yeah. Um, but let me thank you very much. This was a terrific presentation, real tour d'horizon, which was fantastic. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Derek, for coming. Thank and you. thank you all for listening and great questions. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you.